Thank you so much. We appreciate that. We appreciate being here. This is really an excellent opportunity to collaborate, cooperate with people who are doing such great uh, work in the field. And, uh, you know, we are doing so many uh, great things together. Like before, before this whole, uh, all these, you know, programs that came to the fore with peers and other clinicians, we didn't know Peer Voices of Orange County. So I'm, I'm very happy that we are collaborating with Peer Voices of Orange County and other organizations. So without further ado, let's get started. This is about peers and clinicians training. And uh, so I'll, with uh, collaboration between the three organizations, both Nodus Clinic, American Addiction Institute, and Peer Voices, we have put this, I would say, unique program together that is what we believe is very much needed and nobody really is, um, has uh, created a systematic methodical program to actually train what we are going to be training about and talking about. Now, our whole training is 12 weeks. So we are just going to present on the, or more or less give you an overview of what those 12 weeks are going to be, to be about. Why did we create this program in the first place? What's the need and what we believe is the solution? Uh, so with that in mind, let's get started, which is what's the actual problem? Uh, the problem very much is that people like Orlando and myself, we have been trained differently. We have come, we come from different backgrounds, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, both clinical, non-clinical experiences. And uh, also there are different regulations that more or less uh, kind of direct what we are supposed to do in the field. However, both of us, uh, Orlando as a peer support specialist, as a peer leader, myself as a psychologist, therapist, so to say, as a clinician, we both are service providers and we both are involved with consumers from different uh, perspectives. We both are pro probably interacting with the same types of clients, if not the same client at times especially let's say in a multidisciplinary approach. However, because of the you know, background history foundation of our training and again, those regulations, we treat consumers differently. We have to, at times, you know, we are kind of literally ordained or, or, or directed and limited, um, instructed to do certain things in a certain way and uh, many times it is rooted in simple effectiveness, what works. And at times it is uh, rooted in, uh, in law or ethics and, and uh, again, background and, and training. However, uh, you kind of as examples of those two camps, two groups, clinicians on the one hand and peers on the other hand, that uh, tend to clash with each other. They step on each other's toes. They uh, completely, you know, all constantly disagree with each other, sometimes sabotage each other's work. And ultimately the consumer is suffering, right? Because they get different messages, opposing viewpoints, different directives, different types of supports. Sometimes those types of supports, even though they're well-intentioned, they um, clash with one another. They're kind of contradictory to each other. So uh, many times the consumers are confused, lost, misinformed, uh, misdirected, and um, even uh, you know uh, they they basically miss out on the support itself and the services uh, themselves. And the services themselves are not really delivered at the most effective, efficient way due to these issues and problems. So that's the problem. And uh, uh, with that in mind, we have thought about, well, how can we create a solution? Uh, so in order to do so, we got to look at some core competencies. Like that's where we went back to and said, you know, why is, why is there a problem at all? You know, how, how did it, how was it created? Part of it goes back to the core competencies of the training. So here, 
Orlando, maybe you want to speak a, a, a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add a little bit more on the on the issue of the problem. I wanted to at least give a, a flair for the the peers perspective just real quick. You know, bottom line from a, I want to definitely represent the peers since I am a peer. Uh, you know, we always go around and say we have that MLE, that masters of lived experience as a peer. And I definitely want to bring that to the table and really represent the peer side. Um, I think as a peer, I, the big problem that I see is the fact that we don't understand the clinical side. We're not trained in that area. And I, and I think collaborating, and that's why this is so exciting for me, is collaborating on that clinical perspective, seeing their perspective and being able to bring the value of the peer, the lived experience to that as close as we can to, to be able to work together. Uh, there's definitely differences. There are things that are never going to be able to be different based on the fact that the the regulation that you know the, what regulates the clinical perspective is is not going to change. So, but I think there are a lot of things that we can do, and I think that's what this training is about. So, I just wanted to bring that perspective. But going to the next slide um, in regards to you want to go to the next one here. Thank you. Core competency, as we know, DHCS you know has has really brought up. Um, you know, 17 core competencies for peers. There's a peer uh, based on SB803 and all that. We see now that the you know peers are being certified, and and in such a and in such a diverse way because there is just the beginning, but there's going to be a lot more specialized training that is going to really encompass all the areas in behavioral health. So I think um, for us, you know, the core competencies of of peer you know, uh, the specialists are already written out. Most people who are peers, uh, um, you know, pretty much have uh, understood that with DHCS and are getting the training necessary. And many of these things have been going and being trained throughout, even before the certification, but not now. Now it's in a really straightforward, um, you know, fashion. But sharing, you know, personal experience is definitely a core competency for peers. You know, providing that emotional support, getting that connection, uh, helping individuals develop coping skills. These are just some of the few and, and definitely providing resources and referrals. We, we always know that we are not to provide anything clinical. And I think that's the area we want to be able to work through in this training and see how we work together. So with that, go ahead, Dr. G. I don't know if you want to go for some of the, the areas for the psychotherapist. Yeah, I was muted. So, uh, yes, so definitely. To, now, in contrast, what do clinicians get, you know, trained in? You go to mostly, where do you go? Do you go to college, to schools, to really get actual, you know, formal kind of, again, systematic training, right? And you got to understand how, you know, uh, the models of psychology, human behavior, um, uh, kind of explain the um, health or pathology on the you know two different ends of the spectrum. Got to understand how to be able to assess you know the, a person's presentation predicament at a certain moment, and uh, and then come up with a solution. There is a usually the whole methodology uh, you know uh, lays out a basically a roadmap. The roadmap starts with some formal assessment, diagnosis, based on this assessment and diagnosis, you ought to come up with a treatment plan and then um, implement the therapeutic support, whether it is you know, just the therapy itself and then different types of, let's say, therapeutic support, whether it is like in a group format or individual format or maybe a couple family format and so forth. And also think about the multidisciplinary aspect of it. So uh, that's where clinicians, you know, how they are trained and guided. It's very kind of a formal, you know, method-oriented type of um, uh, basically uh, journey, you know, that they're put onto, like literally a kind of a train of thought and experience. That's how they are um, equipped and then more or less put in the market, in, in the society, in the market, in the field. Certainly they have to get real life experience, which we call internships, right? Practicum internships and empirical 
uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one connections. And I think there is that contrast right there, as you explained, Orlando, where uh, by definition, peers are already integrated in the society, in the community. You know, that's how they, they kind of start, right? It's more like a felt experience from the beginning. Uh, not only have they have, uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm a peer too, basically, uh, but in general, like as a group, right, peers, they not only have they had their own personal experiences, but they have been immersed in the experiences of others alike versus clinicians don't necessarily start that way, right? So right. they and go Dr. G, I was going to intervene, and, and, yeah. and that is one of the core competencies, and also that I know we didn't put on here, but definitely being having that, um, sharing that personal experience. I know we mentioned that, but I think it's really embedded in who a peer is. You know, being able to tell your story, uh, being able to, you know, you know, do the support groups, for example, all of that are things that connect them in a totally different way than a clinician. So that 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 changes the dynamic right there. And and that's why also one of the things that I'm sure many people have noticed uh, that clinicians are not really good uh, initially uh, at, at connecting. Right? Well, you're being kind. You're being very kind. <laughs> no, that's the truth, right? Unless they have had you know, pretty yeah. good experience, but right out of the school, they're just not, right? Where does that come from? Whereas peers are just comfortable, like that's really where the frequency starts with the connection and then it goes to support and help. Whereas with clinicians, it is first, oh, let me support, let me, yes. let me implement what I learned and then connect, right? It's so weird. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And we've, and we've tested it in support groups between peers and clinicians. We've seen the examples of how clinicians operate a support group versus, um, you know, maybe in a in more of a, a, a clinic, clinical perspective. And so those are, yeah, definitely there's very big differences. Very good. So now part of it also comes kind of is, is historical, right? We talked about some kind of fundamental, let's say, causes for the rift and these differences. And uh, so one of them, the core competences are different. The other one, the history of the whole, uh, uh, let's say the, these cadres of providers are different. So we wanna speak about the history of peer support workers. Yeah, definitely. As far as the history, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we don't have, and I, I was just about to write on the chat. And one of the things is, you know, peers don't have um, two, you know, hundred years, two hundred years of history, like in, in the in, in this area of the psychotherapist. But the history of peers um, really emerged in the in the eighties. Although for myself personally, I think that that came through from really even the twelve step programs. I consider that more of a peer type, and that's been around for a while. But in the nineteen eighties, peer run organization, you know, uh, began to emerge. Um, and they were providing non-clinical support and advocacy for people with mental illness and substance abuse disorders, which now we, we call uh, behavioral health. We've included both of those. Um, and and the, the, the first peer specialist training was really established in Georgia in 1993 with a focus group on training individuals with lived experience to support and, and, and do advocacy uh, in the behavioral health system. You know, since then, you know, we've seen that uh, California has been one of the last states to actually provide the, you know, the the actual certification of peers. And I think that's the interesting part. California, I, I think, even though we were one of the last ones, I think there's one more state that I can't recall now. But bottom line is we are really one of the last ones to enter this frontier. Uh, we have had a lot of data and I think they've done a pretty good job of encompassing what a peer is. And I think that history right now, what we're doing is we're creating a system, of course, going into the Medi-Cal billing is one of the areas for billing services. But as far as the history of peers, it is, it is not as long. And I think we recognize that. And I think that's one of the areas where I think it's still, a, it's still young. So we don't have that foundation like uh, like psychotherapists and clinicians to say, oh yeah, you know, 
Um, we have uh, we have Freud here. We have you know we we have you know, we have all of this behind us. So I, I think that's also an imbalance that we're still trying to overcome and be able to build upon. But I, I think that we have a good foundation. And with that, go ahead, uh, Dr. G. I if Beautiful. you want to do it on the clinician side. Yes, that's the clinician side. So it goes a little bit longer, right? And beyond that, not only does it go beyond Freud, you know, into literally centuries, if not millennia, where clinicians kind of as a group of service providers have been tasked, you know, with that job of, um, of attending to the problems and finding solutions. Therapy itself, by the way, uh, coming from Greek uh, root or uh, Latin root, it means attending. That's what therapy means. Now, attending, uh, however, uh, whom do you trust, right, to attend to a problem and come up with a solution? So traditionally, uh, medical um, staff have been uh, trusted, right, with that type of a role and authority and credibility. So doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, psychiatrists, before even we did have psychologists with the notion of a psychiatry, doc, medical doctors who also were there to help with psychological problems and issues. And then over the last 130, 40 years, we have come up with the notion, this new category of therapists, right? Now, and also a pure psychologist, let's say, and they're just kind of a little bit of a competency uh, levels, education, competency, and so forth in regards to how far do you go? If do you end at the master's level or doctoral level, and then specialties that you can achieve to be called a psychologist or a psychiatrist, or just as a general category, a therapist, but all of them, including nurses, doctors, etc., they're regarded as clinicians. And I think the distinction really is that formal training, right? Uh, and there is a pretty good reason why clinicians generally have been entrusted with care, right? And coming up with diagnosis and treatment plans because there's so much complexity to human behavior. And, uh, you know, it takes literally years to go through uh, all kinds of, um, you know, ways of really conceptualizing, understanding, the, 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 this uh, elusive human condition, so to say. What is healthy, what is not, what is destructive, what is called an impairment or dysfunction versus function? How do you differentiate, let's say, hearing something? If somebody says, I'm hearing some voice or myself or a voice in my head or uh, hearing myself, is that endangering to somebody? What is that level? So there's always like a spectrum of, um, you know, behaviors that can be completely uh, innocent and um, non-dangerous, um, safe, all the way to dangerous, and they can fall under the same spectrum, for instance, hearing a voice, right? So how do we differentiate that? Uh, that requires a lot of years of training, right? So traditionally, that's where history of clinicians uh, helps us understand why do they exist, uh, what do they go through, and there's a, been a good tradition for many, many centuries, really, developing this type of a workforce. Yeah, absolutely. No, and and I think and I think uh, rightfully so. I mean, when you're when you are working with someone, I mean, you do want that competency to be at a, a very high level, and people expect, uh, you know, to get someone who actually can understand uh, everything from an evidence-based, and I, and I think that rightfully so, they have their place. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of areas where peers get, you know, are, they're not there to diagnose for sure, but they definitely are there to support and help someone understand. And that's one of the roles that we, we play, you know, make them, help them understand and actually even be able to speak to their therapist as that's, I mean, sometimes I know I personally have taken that, have had that role where I have to say, okay, well, you, this is how you have to talk to the therapist. This is how, well, my therapist doesn't seem to listen. Well, this is the way you, so in some ways that is the facilitator 
you know, again, there's time restraints for therapists, as we know, and psychiatrists, and everyone does complain about that. So I think the therapist has that place where they can actually able to facilitate the roles of a ther the therapist role and the psychiatrist role and help that uh, person in recovery or in therapy or in trauma be able to better advocate for themselves, be able to speak up and say, this is what's going on. And sometimes even challenge that authority, as we know, we've talked about this, that authority has to sometimes be challenged because, you know, you're going to someone where you may be old traditional way of like, cure me, fix me, right? Yeah. And, and there's a lot of therapists that uh, tend to have that kind of concept as well, even today's days, right? Yes, so definitely. Think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, there, there are different roles and purpose, and you mentioned a few of them. And I think for the sake of time, we got to speed it up a little bit. So yeah. I'm going to quickly uh, just kind of contrast, which I think I already uh, addressed the roles and purpose of clinicians to really provide that official roadmap, diagnosis, assessments, and so forth. And you mentioned very well that, you know, uh, and, and you kind of alluded to it, but officially it's also known that clinicians uh, do not necessarily have good bedside manners. You know, doctors, physicians, right. in fact, a lot of nowadays uh, courses and training that take place for doctors, physicians, nurses, et cetera, they now are starting to include very much, uh, you know, uh, the type of uh, bedside manner technology, so to say, which is requiring the, the interns to spend time with patients, go to, uh, you know, groups and talk to patients, get to know them, learn how to empathize and so forth. Now, clinicians have learned that a lot. However, uh, as you're saying, there, there's still also, uh, and we know that in the field of therapy, there's always this ingrained imbalance between more or less authority or power. You know, therapists, uh, they have like this, um, um, like ingrained in, in, in kind of uh, um, level of authority and, and power that they just comes with the position of therapist, of a clinician. Um, and sometimes they are themselves not aware of it, you know, how it comes across. And that may shut down, let's say, a, a consumer or a client. And But, peer, but peers have uh, traditionally, you know, had a lot more a better, stronger connection with one another. That's where their advocacy can become very powerful to help each other, you know, encourage speaking up, you know, asking for your rights, asking for communication, even expressing your own dissatisfaction, this opinion, uh, dissent or opinions that go against a clinician or opinion, so to say, to simply be informed, have a dialogue, have a conversation, right? So uh, those are the and that's where the intersection between the peer support and clinicians comes in. You know, we are, we are interested, unlike many other training facilities that only focus kind of vertically on only training peers or only training uh, clinicians, we are interested in crossing that, that gap and bridge. And really, we're uh, in the field, the kind of the rubber meets the road. Right, where a consumer has to deal with both folks and the, where the clashes happen, such as, you know, let's say uh, we have some examples that are coming up, but one big example is self disclosure, right? We'll get to that. You know, people have different ways of um, self disclosing and putting value in self disclosing. Um, you know, peers do it more often. Uh, clinicians are almost prohibited from doing so. And there are different um, realities or uh, indoctrination literally going on in regards to what is right and what is wrong. That In that clash, in that space, we have a lot of chaos. And what we want to do is help both teams learn more about each other and the benefits of actually inclusion, of having both teams involved and collaborate better with one another. 
Do you want to speak a little bit more to that? Sure. Yeah. In regards to, I was uh, doing a little bit of the chatting there. Some I had some questions. And I think there was a really interesting one in the chat regarding Australia. I definitely would love to hear that one, and and that was super interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, intersections between peer support and clinical practice. Um, I, I think for us is how far I'm going to be honest. I'm going to I'm going to be a peer, which I cannot not be. I, that's who I am. <laughs> so in that sense, how far can we push it? You know, I I think for us. How far can we push the envelope and still maintain that integrity of now staying in the regulatory aspect and staying in compliance? Because I, I think peers are now being held accountable for that compliance. And that's a new area for us. I think for peers that has been new before it was handled, I believe, through organizations or your job. But now it is actually a some of the core competencies are being um, you know, regulated, there's going to be more restrictions on some of those areas. I don't want to lose that peer, that who a peer and what a peer is. So for me, my advocacy is how far can the peer go and be who they are and still be, uh, you know, in compliance and, and work and do what's best for the client. So I think for me, that's kind of like the intersection that I'm looking at. And I think I hear that a lot from uh, my peers as well. Sometimes they have a very difficult time um, working with a clinician. They don't take the value of what they're saying. And that that's terrible because I think they're missing out. The client is the one that's losing. So I think for both camps, respecting each other, but at the same time, being able to understand each other and, and, and turning, like you said, that chaos into harmony is going to be yeah. the most important part of the next step after peer certification. And I think that's why we're right in the front of this uh, wave. Yeah, that's right. So that's where, uh, you know, for us to move into, into harmony, we basically in our training, which by the way, I'm gonna jump to that slide. We have about 12 weeks of training where we review everything. So some of what we already shared with you in, in few minutes, we're going to spend week after week actually going into that program where we are talking about the problem, the challenges, the different uh, factors leading to these differences, and also how we can come up with better solutions. Part of it is to understand and review the laws and regulations and the value of experiential integration and uh, the value of experience itself that uh, Orlando was talking about. So uh, we will go through that, uh, you know, training, education, value of experience, uh, trends that are happening in our 12-week program. And ultimately- well, Dr. G, I wanted to jump in real quick because I, I definitely wanted to, you know, shout out to Darren. Uh, they were mentioning, you know, in Australia and yes, they were saying, the First Nations people with 60,000 years of verbal history. I guess maybe peers could uh, be put into that category. So maybe we beat you guys, you know, if there's a competition, I, I think from that perspective, I think uh, that is, a, a, you know, a form of community support, right? That community support the, and I think that's something that we're rebuilding again, but yes, I love that Darren, that's a wonderful, uh, and we have to kind of, I think, think a little bit more and realize that that is a value. There's an incredible value to that. A huge value, yes. And that's what we want to recognize, right? We want, this is the thing that is happening is that due to more, more systemic training that exists within kind of vertical field, like when clinicians are being trained, they're being trained as clinicians. They're not necessarily being trained to also understand peers and vice versa. When peers are being trained, right? They're being trained to, especially nowadays with more peer certification is coming up is client focus, right? How a peer needs to be at their best for the clients. They're not being trained to understand clinicians, right? So that's the difference. And, and because of that lack of understanding uh, of the other team that exists, and again, this whole you know iceberg that is all the way underneath what where they come from and what laws and regulations what training and the lived experience uh, tells them to do, they lack this type of uh, empathy and also skills how to collaborate with each other. You know, many times I myself 
really before being so active in the field for the past 16 years, as when I was kind of a novice clinician, uh, I had no clue. I didn't have the skills in relating to peers, uh, speaking the same language, acting the same way and so forth. And also peers generally have no clue. Well, how do I relate to a clinician? Where do they come from? What's their understanding? What's their training? What's their you know, history? Uh, so that's where we want to really train everybody to gain that better understanding about each other. It comes through more or less some, a little bit didactic and a lot of experiential interactions, which by the way, allows us to do it right now. And uh, we can break into some- uh, and, and Dr. G, I, again, I'm gonna be up here and I, and again, I, I, we, I wanna, we wanna try to make it not so boring. I mean, the clinical side, let's face it, can be a little bit on the boring side, boring, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I think I think uh, you know you got to bring that dance and song from the peer perspective and be able to bring that that other energy, that other lived experience part. Now it doesn't take away from the absolute value that clinicians have, but you know with that we're going to go to application delivery. We're going to try to maybe go out to two breakout rooms. We put some examples here of some of the areas where we intersect and we may, maybe some peers do it, sometimes clinicians do it, but we, what we want to do, and again, there may be better examples. We want to break out and maybe talk a little bit about how you handle, uh, whether you're a peer or a clinician. And again, we haven't taken hands to see what camp you actually are, are, are coming from. And that would be a good data to, to get, maybe to find that out. But I think if we can break out and maybe Dr. G will take one and I'll take another. Yes, let's do it. We can, we can then go ahead and, and maybe use this as an example um, of, of maybe some of the areas where we intersect and, and see how we relate to them and how we manage them. Yes, Aaron. I need one second. My breakout room's left. Hold on, hold on. All right. Well, just no keep worries. them entertained. Keep them entertained. So, so let me just right. add to what Orlando is saying. What we would like you to do with each, with each other, and we will be part of it too, is do you see these symptoms or clashes? Do you see what we are talking about? Do you see where you as a peer may not be understood by a clinician or vice versa? Do you see... Uh, these types of differences and maybe how these differences are interfering with the client care. That's what we want to talk about in the breakout rooms. I'm going to write that in the uh, chat um, and I will also copy it. So examples of where we clash. That's a good one. You know, we actually hadn't, um, we hadn't put it in that term, uh, but I, I think that that is a, a good way of, of looking at it. Uh, those are kind of some of the examples I'm going to put in there of where we may clash. I think we definitely clash on maybe the course of action with a client for sure, right? I mean, uh, you know, you have a, you're a clinician and you're going and you're, you know, you, you're not maybe, and they're also, also being supported by peers, but you're not asking the peer for their perspective, right? I mean, that's an area that happens a lot. That's right. And just FYI, I think we should break out for about five minutes and then come back to just wrap it up to be on time. Absolutely. That, there you go. Thank you. Wait for Aaron to... Well, wait, yeah, definitely, Aaron. But in the meantime, yeah, definitely that's an area. If anybody wants to put uh, or if anybody wants to raise their hand, we can just start it right here. It's not a big deal. Sure. We can, uh, just start can, it. Yeah, let's go for it. I, I like impromptu. That, and that's the other thing that peers do very well. You know, they impromptu. They're kind of like, okay, there you <laughs> go. Michael, go for it. Yeah, I have been doing this work for about a year. And I find that oftentimes, you know, there's, a com you know, conflicts between the clinician and I. Um, <clears throat> what has helped is like building those relationships with the clinicians, right? Because like, I kind of see myself as a peer for them as well, you know? Um, and like, Good I enough. do peer support with the other people on my team, as well as with the clients that we work with. So, I mean, just, I think it is a lot like understanding the direction that each of us are coming from, you know, and then like using that, because I mean, um, I can use a relationship that I've created with someone you know, to help the clinician maybe do medication management or something like that. But medication management is not my job and I'm not going to do it. But, you know, the clinician might, 
And like, I might be able to help them do that. Those were wonderful um, examples. And, and, and you say you've been doing this for like a year now. And, and I, have you have any training on that? Is, has there been any training uh, to kind of have you um, develop that relationship with, uh, with the clinicians? Um, we've done some sort of like team building activities, which I think yeah. has been helpful specifically on our team. Um, but the training that I got, I got through SHARE and the peer certification course. Wonderful. And I didn't really do that until like just a few months ago. So it's like I kind of been doing this job. And now like I have an idea on like how to do this job. Well, peers uh, definitely do the job um, as they're building their portfolio on, in the air, kind of like building the plane in the air. So I, I do, I do can relate to that. I think for both camps. Uh, Darren, did you? Thank you so much, Michael. Darren, did you want to uh, go ahead and um, and unmute yourself? There you go. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Orlando. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So it's lovely to meet people from overseas. I'm from Australia, actually. And, um, and so I've been a peer worker for 20 years. And um, I think the thing that's really struck me lately, um, I was in a conference and, you know, people were talking there from a First Nations perspective. And I've had the experience myself where clinicians have come and spoken to peer workers and said, um, we need to teach you how to do deep breathing techniques to relieve anxiety. And from a First Nations perspective, they just laugh because they've been doing that for 40,000 years. You know, <laughs> when, when you're anxious, you, you, um, you find a tree, you connect with the tree, you lie down, you do your deep breathing. You know, I, I think a lot of time we... Um, consumers are sort of led to believe that these practices are new, but actually these are just human practices that we're talking about. And they're absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I think yeah. from my perspective, I think the next big shift will come from when we learn to respect the knowledge of our first nations people. I love that. And we do. And, and I definitely agree. And, you know, what, what is interesting, what you're saying that I find interesting is that we're doing this already. What We call this cultural sensitivity. We do that, you know, so exactly what you're talking about is we, we disregard the others. And I, I think that's what you're saying, but we do that in America. So, I mean, you're, you're not, you're not the only one that does it. <laughs> we do that all the time. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I just think it's, it's a humorous Atlantic take, though, isn't it? Like that is uh, amazing. Like, oh, we've got this new, this brand new idea, deep breathing, you know? <laughs> right. wow, that's amazing. Uh, Karen, think, Dr. G, you have your hand up. Yeah, right? so we are ready to go into breakout sessions, but it's uh, your choice. We could just. No, I think we should just take it out right here. I mean, okay. we're good. Karen, we don't need to break up. Yeah, no problem. Did I catch you with your mouth full? Yeah, I just took a drink of coffee and then you were like, Carrie, go ahead. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just wanted to chime in because so many things are coming up for me right now. Um, I'm a peer, but I'm also a supervisor, you know, and um, I, I always, you know, I, I'm trying to integrate our peer services in with um clinical, you know, because everybody wants peer support now, including our SUD side, you know, during this whole process over the last like four years, no one from SUDS has said, hey, can we have a peer or how do we do this? You know, but now they're, the rush is on. But as I do this, I'm, I'm coming across this judgment from the clinical side that, um, and I used to be on the clinical side. I was a substance abuse counselor for 13, 15 years, whatever. But um, what I get from them is, oh, your staff don't do anything. No, our, our, my staff are, you know, working with peers. Well, every time we go in there, all we do is see them sitting, you know, and it's like, yeah, but they're sitting with people, calling people, you know, like it, it's really important to, you know, I, I'm finding for us in Lake County, and we're just a small rural county up in Northern California, but 
um, we're really trying, you know, and so I appreciate this type of training because I've I've been tasked with <laughs> doing a presentation to both clinical on both sides, mental health and um, SUDS treatment on, you know, the differences between clinical and peer support. And so, you know, and this helps out. Sorry, thank you. Oh, Thank you for the feedback. That's excellent. Thank you. Peer and clinical intervention is what this is, right? <laughs> a peer and clinician intervention. I think almost that's what we're call calling it. You have a tough job, so we definitely got to communicate and talk. We definitely want to know a little bit more about what you do. Uh, Todd, uh, you want to Okay, go? I'll put my email in the chat. Perfect. Thank Harry. you. Thank yes. You so much. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with what Carrie said is, you know, we have that issue that is definitely one, but the other one that we have is sometimes with the funders. I'm the director of a peer-run nonprofit. Uh, we do Iowa's only respite house as well as an after-hour wellness recovery center. And when you look at funders and leaders and decision makers, you know, they really don't understand the value of that because we didn't go to Harvard. We didn't go to, you know, Iowa State. Um, we went to the school of falling on our face. And, you know, me, I spent 20 some odd years in management and sales um, before my injury that led to my mental health. And I have that experience. And sometimes when you have that classification, they think, okay, well, yeah, them guys over there, they just do that thing where they hang out at the recovery center. Or yeah, go, go to the respite house, you can, flop around there and do whatever you want, right? I mean, SAMHSA went from calling them drop-in centers to wellness recovery centers to support us and the people, right? And wellness and recovery looks different for everybody. I, I really hate it when I see decision makers and funders say, well, that's not a crisis service. Uh, okay, well, so you're telling me if two losers are keys, that you're going to tell her she doesn't have a crisis. There's no difference in that or a person that's hearing voices or seeing people. It's a crisis depending on the individual. So I think we have that clinical side too, but we also have that community and nation and statewide uh, situation where they don't really understand our job and some are a little skeptical on even learning what our job is. Well, I think Todd, absolutely wonderful. I love everything you've said. I think peers are just beginning, where it's our beginning in California to advocate for themselves and bring that power of what a peer does, because I totally agree with you. So I think we're trying to create that. That's where I think Dr. G and myself are really trying hard to make that middle ground. It really isn't about pointing fingers at this point. It's really about working together and, and figuring out how we can get it done. Um, Bonnie, yes, thank you. Yes, I, this is such a great discussion. Um, I, I really am just echoing the other people when I say that, yes, peers, whether we're consumer peers or family peers, let's not forget the family peers as well, that uh, part of our job is to educate clinical teams on our value. And in most cases, once they know and see the value that we bring to the treatment process or the delivery of services, they're gonna want us at the table. And what just one of the main ways we can help with um, uh, treatment is through engagement and by our connections to either the consumer or the family who might be supporting the consumer in a lot of different ways we can encourage engagement and engagement is key to um, a successful outcome. I absolutely agree. And again, I, you know who the peer is here, right? I mean, definitely as a peer, we have to advocate and I'm about pushing it to the max, uh, making sure that all peers voices are heard and that we're able to, at the same time, respect clinicians and be able to work with them. You know, it isn't a battle. It's really more about joining hands. But at the same time, right now, peers are a little bit, you know, they have to advocate and empower themselves to be able to say, you know, like, like Todd was saying, as far as grants and as far as, you know, getting those, that, those opportunities, 
we have value. And I think with this training and with Dr. G and people and collaborating with clinicians, I think they will see more value. I don't know what you want to say about that, Dr. G. What do you think? Are they going to? Absolutely. Because so this is, um, I think both uh, Orlando and myself come from, um, you know, struggle, right? So we have struggled both ways, you know, to connect. And we, we finally somehow figured it out. So I'm, I'm both more or less peer and clinician. He is a peer and in my opinion is kind of a clinician without the formal training. Uh, and that's the beauty of it because we, what we want to create is very much pass on this skill set and this awareness that it is possible for peers and clinicians to collaborate, cooperate, learn from one another, and you know, do what they need to do, which is be of service to consumers ultimately. And, and Dr. G, you mentioned also to me, and that's one of the things we've done, we're collaborating with a lot of educational institutions. There's some interesting things happening where there may be some certification that Dr. G and ourselves are working on with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna mention who, but there's gonna be some collaboration where there may be a degree in peer certification coming up. So there's some really exciting stuff. You know what, if you don't have the education, it doesn't mean you can't get trained or find and become, get a bachelor's and move forward. So a peer can move forward. A clinician has is also moving forward by understanding peers. So we both are kind of meeting in the middle. And with all the training that's going on, I think that we will get the respect and, and I think we have to advocate for that respect as well. Absolutely, exactly. We will definitely get certified, accredited. We are in the process of doing so. Perfect. You have any other, or how are we doing with time? I know you were sensitive. over. We're a little over. <laughs> a little over. Okay. Well, it doesn't surprise me, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we definitely appreciate the conversation, and uh, we'd love to get everyone's information and and reach out and and get your input more than anything. There's going to be modifications on this on this training, and there's going to the, the real value comes from peers and train and and clinicians coming together and having these discussions, and also putting things in your own practice that can, you know, promote peers and promote clinicians to work together. I think at the end of the day, that's really our goal. And Orlando, please put your email. I put my email in the sure, uh, absolutely. Field. Yeah, put your email. So we are available. Uh, we want to collaborate with everybody. Please reach out to us. I already noted some of the your guys' emails. We will reach out to you. Thank you so much for attending. And we love to expand this idea of peers and clinicians training. So help us do that. Thank you so much, everybody.